Hello, my name is Mary Frances McMullen and I'm a haematologist in Queen's University, Belfast. I want to talk to you today about whether uh, jack 2 vaf allele burden should be implemented as a routine test in a clinical practice in all patients with jack 2 positive MPN. And I'm going to argue against this proposal. So first of all, to think about this, uh, JAK2, which was discovered in uh, the JAK2 mutation, which was discovered in 2005, increases signal transduction and drives quantitative and qualitative alterations in stem cell biology. And this makes it a very interesting subject to study further. And this has been done in lots of different contexts. First of all, um, we've looked at the JAK2 burden in MPN patients and ca categorized it with risk. Um, and we see that sometimes higher amounts of burden are associated with higher risk. And then in many different clinical trials, uh, the JAK2 burden has been studied um, and some very interesting results have recently been discovered in the MAGIC trial, which I was involved JAK2 molecular response, i.e. decrease in the JAK2 burden was associated with event-free survival. And in other trials, we can see falls in the JAK2 burden over time. But none of these are falls with the JAK2 allele burden falling to zero. It's just decreases. That may happen uh, over the years, but we're not there yet. And that brings about the issue as to whether this should actually be measured routinely in MPN patients. And I think we need to consider this very carefully, the thought of introducing another test and what it uh, does for our patients. So the first thing is, um, when we do treat these patients with JAK2 positive MPN, what is actually our target for therapy? Is it the JAK2 uh, VAF burden? Or is it, as exactly the case, we're looking at the full blood count and we're actually trying to control the blood count, not, in fact, uh, seeing falls in the JAK2 burden. Excellent when it happens, but that's not actually the target of therapy. So that says if we bring in a new test, will it actually alter the management uh, of these patients? Um, and I think we have to say at the moment, knowing the JAK2 uh, VAF burden is not actually going to change the management because it's actually the blood count and what the blood count does. And if the blood count gets too low, we stop the treatment. doesn't matter what the, the VAF is, even though that may be good that it is falling. There are another, a number of other things we need to consider if we were to introduce this uh, test or assay. The first thing is the assay itself. What do we actually do? Um, we can take peripheral blood, or many say the gold standard is to take gran to extract granulocytes from a blood sample and then measure the VAF in that. But that's a very difficult test to do. It's not one that's easy for routine labs. And we're then left with different tests, with different results, and we haven't yet got anywhere near the standardization that we saw pre previously for, uh, where we now are with chronic myeloid leukemia. And of course, chronic myeloid leukemia is a good point because when we talk about uh, introducing a test like this, of course, we all think of the BCR able monitoring that we do in chronic myeloid leukemia. And this lead, this is actually a very useful test, which has been developed over 20 years. But we're now in the situation where we see the BCR able level falling right down to zero. And in fact, the test, the BCR able, is associated with improved outcomes and it actually directs therapy. But that's not the case if we were to introduce JAK2 uh, uh, allele burden at this point in time. Other things to consider it's extremely expensive. You work out what it would cost to do this test routinely, where you would be measuring it repeatedly on every patient over time. Work that out. You probably need a couple of new members of staff into the laboratory to do the test. So it's not without implications. There are other implications as well. When we do a test like this, we produce a number. And if you look at the numbers, although you can say JAK2 VAF is higher in, in polycythemia vera than in essential thrombocythemia, 
there's actually a huge range in numbers and overlap between all the different uh, diseases. So we end up with this number, which can be anything from one to 100%. Um, what does it mean? And what is it going to mean particularly to the, 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 the clinician and to the patient? When we give this out to the patients, it's likely to cause difficulties in understanding what it means and a lot of fear and anxiety. Imagine the situation, you know, on the tw Twitter or uh, text, my VAF's 20, oh, mine's up to 40. What, you know, this is going to cause lots of uncertainty without actually changing or, or knowing the context. So overall, I would say that at this point in time, to coin that awful phrase, uh, that the JAK2 VAF should not be implemented as routine practice in uh, MPN patients. It won't change management. Um, we have still lots of difficulties about which sample and standardization. Um, it's expensive. Um, and it will create a climate of fear and uncertainty without changing the outcome. Obviously, in the future, that may be different, but now the answer is no, it should not be implemented. Thank you.